And we are rolling live with Crystal Arbor. Thank you for joining me today. You're welcome. Nice to be here. Right, really good to be here. <laughs> Didn't know that we're going to be live with uh, with video podcasting, but that's all right. So uh, for our listeners who are watching this live on Facebook or YouTube or LinkedIn, uh, this will be rebroadcast on all the different podcast channels. All the major ones from Apple, Spotify, Anchor, you name it, we're probably there. But uh, Crystal, I've been looking forward to this one because in 100 and however many episodes I've done, we haven't really dug into EMDR and you are an EMDR specialist. Why did you choose that uh, modality out of all the different modalities? Oh, that's a great question. Really good question. Um, well, I fell into EMDR by accident, actually. Um, and I it was the one modality that I was resisting the most when I when I was in school, I heard about it. And um, and, you know, the gold standard for treating PTSD or, or PTSD, or PTSD is prolonged exposure and CBT. And, um, I kept hearing about EMDR, EMDR. And I just, I, I thought, well, it sounds kind of weird, you know, like people are moving the finger back and forth. And I don't think that really suits me that much because I went to school to be a, you know, trained counselor and that just seems kind of odd. And, um, and then uh, I finally broke down and took the training. Um, and uh, in the training, I thought it was ridiculous uh, because, again, with the, you know, follow my finger and suddenly this weird magic is going to happen. And, and I remember my uh, teacher, who's now my mentor, um, saying, are there any critics in the room? And of course I put my hand up. I was brave enough to put my hand up. And he said, oh, I love critics, you know? And I, I thought that was kind of interesting because when I was in school, you know, if you criticized anything, you were you were gonna, you know, <laughs> it wasn't a good, good situation. <laughs> and so I was very frightened, but he was just lovely. And he really took to me at that point because he knew that I was a critic and he, I think he felt inspired to show me the research and and show me the evidence and then he also felt inspired to make sure that in practicum i experienced my had my own experience with um with the emdr so um when i actually did emdr in practicum on my own trauma i found it to be incredibly uh what would be the word i was very curious it was interesting i did have um some interesting um experiences where it didn't seem the trauma that i chose to work on didn't seem to have the same sting to it so it got me curious and i decided well the worst that's going to happen is i start using this in practice and my clients say it doesn't work and i give it up and uh, i started using it actually on the downtown east side when i was working in a clinic um as a as a as a social worker therapist and there's a lot of trauma on the downtown east side a lot of folks with trauma and um, substance use is this and, the same area as uh, the vancouver skid row yes pretty much yeah okay. pretty much and um i was pretty fortunate because it's a free clinic and the folks that came to me could come to me for as long as they wanted so i had this wonderful opportunity to take emdr and use it the way that the researcher Francine Shapiro, psychologist had used it, which is let's just start at the beginning of your life, clear up the trauma there, move on up until we get to today and the triggers that are bothering you today. And I got to work with folks for, I think most of them, I think the longest I worked was about four years. So I had this wonderful opportunity to see if it worked or didn't work. And my clients came back and said it, it was working and it was really, changing their lives in crazy ways. And uh, so that's my long winded answer to your you actually, question. Did you actually see people getting off the streets as a result? That's a really good question. Um, the, the folks that were committed to the, the treatment, yes. So they were living, um, yeah. So uh, probably for the first six months to a year, most of the clients that had committed to the EMDR, we worked on stabilizing, getting housing, helping with substance use in some cases, not in all cases. And then um, I also ran a group. So I run a trauma skills group. And that was really helpful because what it did is it built cohesion, it built a community. 
And then those folks went to that group. They learned skills on how to regulate and how to deal with some of their triggers at the same time as doing the EMDR. And we didn't just jump into EMDR, like there was a process of stabilization and then they ended up doing the EMDR on, on some of their more difficult to traumatic events or experiences that they'd had. Do you believe that the root of all addiction or at least the majority of addiction is trauma? That's a loaded question. I do think a majority of it is trauma. However, there is a biological piece to substance use that I don't think is talked about enough. Um, there are folks that are kind of pre, uh, what do you call it? They're loaded on both sides. So they have, you know, mom has addiction on her side, dad has addiction on his side. And, you know, they don't necessarily come from a bad home but they can be vulnerable biologically or they can pre How do we know that it actually is biolog biological and not environmental? I mean, if you grew up in a, in a home where you see addiction, that's traumatic. So is that biological or is that just what you know? Yeah, I think it's both. It could be both. Um, I think if you see addiction role modeled in your home as a way to cope, um, you're, you could be, could be could be more vulnerable to um, choosing that as a way to cope with uh, stress or to a way to cope with PTSD symptoms. Um, you could end up with PTSD as a result of having a family member who um, abused substances in the home as well. And then you're maybe coping to deal with that PTSD. We call that intergenerational trauma because it's just passed on from one generation to the next. Yeah. Are you talking about epigenetics as well? Yeah, yeah. So that's a really fascinating um, area of research. Yeah, so that that also plays into it. I'm not totally familiar with epigenetics, but that plays a role for sure. How would you define epigen epigenetics? How would I define it? Oh boy. Um. So I you guess didn't I would... know that there was going to be a quiz today, did you? No. Good grief. <laughs> um. I guess I would define that as, um. You know, in the Holocaust, uh, when um, mothers were carrying their babies, um, the babies ended up experiencing the trauma of the mother who had survived the Holocaust, let's say, and then that mother ends up passing on that stress to the baby. And um, maybe that baby was extremely loved and grew up in a great home, but ends up being passed on the gene of trauma. So I guess that's kind of a, that's a very layman's way of explaining it because <laughs> I'm not an expert in epigenetics. Well, it works. Uh, the, I think the, the general idea is that trauma gets stored in the body. Yeah. At, at whatever level, whether it's DNA or, or, or whatever, it gets stored in the body. And if it's in your genetics, if it's in your genes and you have offspring, it just keeps getting passed on. Exactly. And, and um, people talk about past life uh, experiences. Well, it's kind of like that. Yes. You know, yes. regardless if you believe in past lives or not, uh, which actually I, I think there's a pretty good chance there is personally, but it's neither here nor there. Uh, but the idea is, is the past life of your genetics um, can affect what your parents went through, what your grandparents went through. And we're still uh, trying to shake off the expe the the effects of World War II right now. Hundred percent, yes, 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 and uh, <clears throat> that's how I got involved in uh, learning about PTSD and and studying PTSD. Uh, my grandfather served in World War II in the Air Force in England, and then went on to. Um, serve in the air force uh with cold some cold war missions and he had ptsd and he came from a background where you just do not talk about it you just pull up your bootstraps you don't talk about it you don't go to counseling did he That's, know that he has ptsd or is that no he did he didn't know and i mean i'm guessing but it was quite obvious to me that he had been affected mm -hmm. um and he ended up um drinking to cope um, and he would take periods of abstinence, have periods of abstinence and then drink and in the end he ended up um, unfortunately I mean he passed away in his 80s so he had a good life but he did end up experiencing the effects of alcoholism in the end yeah yeah so he passed that on right yeah how old were you when he passed away 
Uh, he, I think I was 25, 25. Yeah. Yeah. What year was that? I think it was 1994, 95. I'm not 100%. You're testing my memory now. <laughs> I ask because my, uh, both my grandfathers served in World War II. And um, on my dad's side, he died in 96. And I was in a war in 94. Okay. And, um, after I was in a war as a peacekeeper, all of a sudden the treasure trove of uh, stories opened up. He, he mm. never told his son. He never told my dad, but he would tell me because uh, now I had been in a war. Yes. And uh, did, did your granddad share any stories with you? He didn't. Um, he he had an album of um, that he had kept from traveling around the world, and I remember being a child and <laughs> there was some drama around a picture from the Middle East and they were all, everyone was trying to keep this picture away from me. And uh, that's all I remember. I just remember that it was a secret. Uh, we weren't allowed to talk about it. Um, and that was it. Yeah. And a stoic doesn't even begin to describe my grandfather. I mean, he was the most stoic man I'd ever met. <laughs> yeah. How much of an influence was he on you as far as getting into this work that you're in now? I think he was probably the biggest influence, actually, because, um, and I have it on my website, actually, I have a memory of my, my grandfather. Um, my, my father often would say to me, you know, granddad never talks about the war. It's not something he talks about. Don't ever bring it up. Um, and I have a memory of watching uh, The Sound of Music, and I was sitting on my grandpa's knee and uh, a tear came down his face at, at some point in the movie. And this was just like a, a, a really big deal, right? Because my grandpa didn't show his feelings. And um, I told my dad and my dad was just like stunned. And he talked about it for weeks and weeks and weeks. He couldn't believe that my grandpa had like shared a tear. And he said, well, if he shared a tear with you, that means you're really special, right? And I felt that connection with my grandpa that I had never felt with him before. Um, and so, uh, and, and also I have like lots of military in my family too. So it's my grandpa, uh, but I'll get to that. Anyways, so when I was recruited to work at the BCOSI clinic from the downtown east side, which is a huge jump leap. And I was nervous and thought, what the heck? I thought about my grandpa and I thought, you know what? Maybe I'm ready. Maybe this is a point in my career where um, I can make a difference. And if I can't, I'll leave and no harm, no foul. <laughs> I just won't work with vets. And I ended up going to the clinic and uh, I knew that the MDR was effective because I had used it for a number of years. And I, th and I knew that it was effective with vets because uh, I was uh, involved with consult groups and professionals that were already using it. And, uh, and I created a pilot program there and it was such a huge success. Um, and so I've never looked back. I'm just so grateful i'm hoping my grandpa's looking down going i'm so proud of you <laughs> hopefully <laughs> the work that you've been doing with veterans do you feel that you understand your grandfather better now because the work you've done with the veterans oh that's such a great question you know when i was working in that pilot program um and i was also working with first responders too i was able to have more compassion for the ptsd that is rampant in my family <laughs> Uh, I was also able to understand my dad better. My dad didn't serve. He wasn't in the military, but he ended up being passed on PTSD from his dad um, and mom. And so, uh, yeah, I had a much better understanding. There were, uh, that's such a great question because there were a number of times in therapy even where I'd have an epiphany. Oh, and that was very healing for me personally. I found that to be a, a, a gift that I didn't expect. So that was because I, 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 you know, I didn't expect that. So that was really kind of wonderful. Yeah. What have you discovered the difference between military related PTSD and first responder um, related PTSD and other types of trauma? Like what has been the delineator for you? What have you learned as you've evolved through this process? Yeah. You remind me of a story of when I first went to the clinic and I was recruited there and I was so gullible and really naive. And um, I remember some of the docs coming up to me and they used the term tertiary PTSD. And I'd never heard that before. And I was kind of angry 
that they were kept saying this because I knew what tertiary meant. It basically meant that it was the end of the line, very um, extreme, and that it would be repetitive throughout life. So when we talk about tertiary psychosis, we know that what that means is, is that the person will be in psychosis, they'll have periods of remission, but they, they will continue to have psychotic episodes for the rest of their life. So when they used this term, I was kind of annoyed because in my community of EMDR, we don't talk like that. We, we carry a message of hope. But interestingly, I realized that I was also naive, but I'm kind of glad that I was naive because I was able to carry that hope. And I think that's why a lot of folks that came to my office felt like, wow, like maybe this could really help. And, you know, there is substance to that placebo <laughs> effect too, right? Where, well, if I believe it's going to work, it's going to work, right? So anyways, but what I've learned now um, is that PTSD with combat and PTSD with in first responders such as police or paramedics is going to be much different than childhood trauma. It's going to be much different than a critical incident. Um, is it more difficult to treat? Um, it might take longer. Um, and I think relationship is really the key when it comes to treating trauma well. And that that's something that I learned on the east side. So if I have a vet that comes in to my office and they don't trust me and we're not jiving um, and that doesn't change, it doesn't matter what the heck I do. <laughs> I could be doing the, you know, the most evidence-based prolonged exposure, which is sort of the gold standard, although we know EMDR matches that now. Um, I can be doing all the best stuff in the world. I can be doing somersaults in my office, but if I don't have a relationship with that vet, it's not going to happen. What's so, the biggest barrier to a relationship with a veteran hmm. for you? Because I can guess it. Oh, can you? I'm sure you can. Yeah, go ahead. Well, you tell me if I'm close. I have seen at the OSI clinic and uh, that a veteran with a, with a tour or two or five and who is in a specific branch, let's say, I'll, I'll use the airborne example. Okay. And airborne guy comes in and if you weren't airborne, never mind infantry or anything else. No, no. It, it has to also be airborne. You just don't understand me, man. And uh, he just feels that his experience is so radically different from anybody else's that you can't get it. And if a clinician wasn't in the airborne, which how in the hell are you going to find a clinician with airborne experience? But um, you just don't get it. You don't understand. And what I'm thinking is that although it's a self-defeating sort of prophecy that, that they're coming up with, it's also what they're actually saying is I, I'm looking for that connection and it hurts me when I don't find it. And when, when I'm misunderstood, um, it's just too painful. So I, I don't want to open up to somebody and be misunderstood. Yeah, that that's 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 it. Yeah, and in fact, it's funny that you bring up the airborne <laughs> because no, that's work. an actual story from the OSI clinic of oh, people really? I've witnessed and um, uh, we're, we're uh, talking with a guy that was armored. Okay, uh -huh. and I'm like, okay, well, I, it, it's not it's still combat arms, man. Like, there's not that much of a split, but he wouldn't even talk to infantry people, and uh, yeah. it's like, yeah. But it's the same job, except we don't jump out of planes. Mm -hmm. we, we wait till it lands, then get out. <laughs> 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 it's the same job otherwise. Yeah. You know, th that's such an excellent point. Uh, there's two things I want to say about that. So one is I don't try and pretend that I know the culture. And even, even though I've learned many things about the culture, uh, I try to stay away from that because it's very obvious that I'm a civilian and it's extremely obvious that I'm not, I'm not um, uh, from that community at all. So what I usually do is I, um, if I have to, I'll just name that right away. We'll just talk about that elephant immediately. Like, look, I know nothing. Plan. Yeah. You know, you, you teach me, that's fine. You don't teach me, that's okay too. But at the end of the day, I'm an expert in treating PTSD and that's what we're going to talk about. Well, that's um, it. It's about the symptoms and exactly. uh, and the process, not not about uh, being able to super duper relate to the experience. Exactly, exactly. And, what, and 
And the other piece I want to talk about with that is, is we have a, a, a saying in EMDR called blind to therapist. And that is probably the one thing that makes EMDR extremely effective. So what that looks like is if somebody comes into my office and they have a horrific trauma or incident and they don't want me to know because I'm a civilian and I get it, I don't need to know about it in order for us to treat it. Whereas with prolonged exposure and CBT, you're going to have to talk about it a little bit, right? Now, if somebody wants to talk about it and they feel like that's going to be their healing, great. I'm more than open to listen. And I don't have a problem with that at all. But most of the time, especially in the early stages of getting to know a vet, they don't want to talk about it. And so I say, that's cool. Just, just think about the worst part of it in your mind and let's start processing. I don't need to know any detail for this to work. And I think that's what makes EMDR pretty special. Um, interestingly, though, when I give people that option, they end up telling me eventually. <laughs> so it's kind of a, a paradoxical uh, treatment in some ways because there is a lot of benefit to talking so i don't want to i don't want to dismiss that piece because that's extremely therapeutic when someone can actually talk about the incident with a therapist that can remain neutral not fall apart and be able to just witness and, and listen you know um but if they can't we can still get busy and do treatment and when i was doing the pilot program i did the blind to therapist a number of times and it was very effective can EMDR done wrong make the uh, trauma injuries worse? Uh -huh. That's a good question. I asked because yes. I, had, I had ART mm -hmm. and it made it so much worse. Oh. So much worse. Yes. So, you know, it's case by case. So everybody is different. That's the first thing. So there's no package treatment for everybody. Um, and each person is going to need you know a different treatment plan based on their treatment based on their symptoms based on how they're coping with their trauma uh, one of the things that we talk about a lot in the emdr community if the psychosocial stressors are really high so if somebody's going through a divorce or they've lost a loved one or they're grieving the loss of a loved one probably not a good time to be diving into combat trauma or diving into trauma from um from a tour um and that's the same with first responder trauma um if a person is coping with alcohol or substances or other we call them dissociative behaviors so they're maybe involved in other addictions gambling whatever it is so they don't have to be inside themselves and dealing with their triggers uh, we probably don't want to be diving in to trauma because what's going to happen their coping symptoms are going to kind of go off the rails and so we want to stabilize that stuff first and um, in my pilot program the reason it was a success and I'm full disclosure now is because we excluded some of those folks. We didn't want to like throw them into uh, the deep end and be doing four hours of processing if we knew that they had a drinking problem on the side. Um, and the other thing that is so important um, that I've learned is, is just the rates of suicidality are very high um, in this population and in first responder population, it's disproportionate. So, I'm not going to be diving into trauma if I know that um, they're not state, the person doesn't have stability or they don't have good supports in place. So, yeah. I've certainly seen a high suicide rate on Facebook uh, all, all the time. It's like, oh, there's somebody else I know who's <laughs> dead, died by yes. suicide. Awesome. And yeah. that's a big reason why I do this show is trying to um, create a sense of connection, not just provide the resources and talk about the resources and bring them to. But by hearing a familiar veteran voice, uh, talking in a way that is understandable, uh, understandable. <laughs> I use my own language at, uh, that is understood and, and relatable. It's a, it's a form of peer support, this yeah. show. And um, you talked about connection. And tell me about trauma and connection and disconnection. Uh, yeah, so connection as in connecting with the vet or connecting, I'm just not sure what you meant there, sorry. <laughs> That's all right, I was going to see if it uh, resonated with you or not. Um, 
what I've witnessed and with myself, with others, is that PTSD creates disconnection from self, from a sense oh. of self, from yes. a sense of community, yes, from, from, from a sense of, um, <laughs> and creates isolation. And mm -hmm. the isolation is the pain. Isolation yes. from yourself, isolation from community, isolation from a sense of purpose. Yes. And uh, that is the pain. The isolation is the fucking pain. Yes. Which is, which is why uh, peer support groups, activities, um, activity based uh, uh, get togethers are so important and also so goddamn dangerous because uh, you go into a place where you think, okay, this is cool. This is a safe place to be. And then it doesn't end up being that safe place because somebody is douchey by accident or, um, you know, because it's, it's a vulnerable sort of situation. And if you uh, have somebody where they're not a soft place to land, you know, or they're judgmental of in some way, you never go back and you go back to the isolation where it's safe. Yeah, I mean, that is the ongoing um, challenge that therapists have. Um, Absolutely. I mean, PTSD is a disease of avoidance. So mm -hmm. what that means is, is that uh, people avoid and they, uh, when they are experiencing these types of symptoms, like intrusive thoughts and flashbacks and catastrophic thoughts of things happening to themselves in the future, their family, um, they, they do start to feel unique. And in that uniqueness, the um, uh, normal and very, um, human response to that is to isolate. Um, unfortunately, the isolation makes everything a hundred times worse. Yeah. Um, and that's when someone can be very vulnerable to suicide. Um, but I loved how you brought up the point of, you know, you can have that peer connection or you can go to a group and it can also be very dangerous. And I've heard that. I understand exactly what you're talking about because I've had clients say, you know, the instructor thinks they know us and they don't. Then, you know, the instructor's a doc and they're talking to us like they know us because they've been working with us for a number of years, but they're never going to know unless they've been there, done it. Right. And that is very off putting for the folks or um, someone is like a douche in the group and that's mm -hmm. it. They're out. Right. Or I often hear um, someone is going on and on about their uh, story and it's just triggering the crap out of me and I got to get out of here. I can't take it. I can't deal with it. Um, and so hello. Uh oh, you're gone. Where'd you go? Difficulty. Let's just bring Crystal back on here. Okay, there we go. You're, you're back. I don't know what happened there. <laughs> that was funny. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so the trick, it's tricky. You know, um, we often in the field talk about the difference between heterogeneous and homogenized groups. Like, is it okay to put a bunch of vets in the room? together without anybody else in that room from a different profession? Is it okay to um, put a number of different types of profession in the same room that we think is similar, like cops and vets? And what we learn is there's no hard and fast rule there. <laughs> sometimes it's a disaster and sometimes it works really well. But I think ultimately it's up to the facilitator, whoever that is, whether it be a peer support facilitator or a professional, to understand how to create safety. And let me tell you, that's a tall order. <laughs> that's a well, tall it's, order. It's, honestly, it's all about the housekeeping, uh, housekeeping and delivery. So with the OSI clinic, um, I mean, I'm very grateful for it. Don't get me wrong. But uh, there was a lot about it that was not a great experience. And, yeah. it was, and it was not great for a lot of people. And I saw a lot of people come in and pop right back out and never come back. Mm -hmm. And because of um, how things were delivered, who was delivering it, what was delivered, uh, there's a, something called the Stabilization Series, which is a 10-week deal where you come in once a week and... <laughs> When they get into the part about uh, personal hygiene, you know, it's like, what do you, what, <laughs> you know, and I understand the point of that, you, you know, uh, that when you're suffering from depression, sometimes people don't shower. I got a uh, uncle who's passed away now. He actually died of starvation because of uh, depression uh -huh. uh, and, and alcoholism and freaking starved to death, you know, mm -hmm. is how bad it was. Mm -hmm. um, but I get it. I get the hygiene part, but 
you, you got to deliver that in a way that's not going to be offensive or taken the wrong way. And um, you, you don't want a kumbaya uh, kind of super soft beta or Charlie ma- male, <laughs> you know, uh, doesn't even qualify as a beta, beta male um, delivering this or being in the super soft kind voice yeah uh it's like you know who you're fucking talking to (laughs) yes yes you know apparently not yeah and um and and for stuff like the stabilization series it does not have to be a clinician that's delivering it there could be a clinician in the corner of the room supervising it does not have to be the one delivering it um it should be somebody who's on the other side of healing that's delivering it saying look i've already uh, been in the hole I dug out of the hole. Here's how I did it. And this is why we're here. Here's the purpose of why we're here, which is how a military lecture happens. It's, it's the language that they understand. Here's what we're doing here. Here's what you can expect. And here's the breakdown. Here's step one. And, and here is the, um, uh, uh, the pros and cons. Here's what you might be experiencing while you're in this room. You might be upset. You might be angry. You might be resentful. And if that happens, it's okay. Just don't pop out, you know, pop out to the door, but not all the way out the the building, you know, and we'll come and we'll talk to you. But this could happen and do that upfront contract and, and give people the lay of the land and the expectations ahead of time. And I suggest for any therapist, that's a good idea because most of us had no idea of what we were getting into therapy can be a son of a bitch yeah and uh, and i don't know that it should be so let's let's go there with emdr is it super intrusive are you reliving the memories what's going on with emdr yeah you are and um you know it's not for everybody i mean i'm i'm the kind of therapist who really believes in informed consent so i just loved what you said because I'll spend a lot of time talking about what you're going to get yourself into before I get you into it. (laughs) And if you decide you're not doing it, I respect that. Um, I think one of the, one of the things that's happening in the EMDR community, which I don't like, is it sold like this. um, It's going to fix everything kind of modality. And it's sort of this quick fix, um, you know, it's, you're going to do six sessions and you're just going to be a new person. And I get a lot of clients that come to me that aren't vets that think, oh, I can just see you for six sessions and you're going to clear up my entire childhood trauma. No, that's not how it works. Unfortunately, that's how it's being sold, but that's not how it works. Um, And I love my vets because they're realistic (laughs) and they don't come in having those expectations. In fact, I have to try to encourage them and um, really try to um, show them that, yeah, we can do this in stages. We don't have to jump into the deep end without water wings. We can like go into the deep end for a little bit and we can get the heck out after three, 10 seconds if you want, but going in a little bit is better than not going in at all. If they're stable, if this person is stable and they feel like they're ready. Um, I have vets I work with and we've never done any EMDR and they refuse and that needs to be respected. (laughs) That's a hundred percent. I can't say, say that strong enough because what we learn is, oh no, you're doing them a disservice if you don't get in there and do that exposure because they could have such a great life. I don't believe that. I believe that it's up to the individual <laughs> to make that informed consent, to, to understand the informed consent, to understand what they're getting into. And if and only when they want to, then this is a tool that I have in my toolbox that I can, I can give that person. Um, What's best case scenario with EMDR? Like 50% fixed, 80% fixed. I doubt it's a hundred. No best case scenario with EMDR is that any outstanding triggers that the person is having with a particular, what, what they call index trauma and other therapies is going to be um, eliminated or managed. Um, In best case, it's eliminated. So the person isn't going to have any more triggers that are connected to that particular, if we want to talk in OSI language, operational stress injury. Um, Best case is that we carry on, maybe we do some intensive EMDR and we clear a number of triggers. Um, But are we going to take away the moral injury? No. 
Are we going to take away depression? No, that all still has to be managed through, um, you know, depression can be managed through cognitive behavioral skills. Moral injury, however, is very much like grief. It's something that's going to be there forever. And we can talk about it, we can make sense of it, but it isn't going to necessarily be magically gone because we did an EMDR session. Do you find that moral injury is one of the toughest things to treat? Oh my God, 100%. Yeah, it breaks my heart, but it also challenges me. I'm one of these people that loves challenges. So uh, if I run across something where I see there's a gap and nobody's fixing it or nobody's talking about it, I'm on it. And I, I, it's, it, I'm studying it right now, actually, because I really want to get better at making making sense of moral injury so that I've had I can different, be of help. Different, different definitions come up with moral injury, and I think there's a bit of confusion about it. So there's there's two different types that I'm aware of. Um, uh, tell me, uh, how would you define moral injury? Well, there's there's a number of, of, of types, actually. You know, there's um, the, the kind where someone's on a mission and they end up doing something that um, they uh, had to do because they were ordered to do and it goes against their, their moral values. Um, so there's that kind. And then there's the kind where... Um, a uh, first responder is um, exposed to a number of child deaths and now they are questioning the meaning of life. Like, what the hell? Why am I here? What, what is the point of all this? Or the horror that they've been exposed to. Uh, I've worked with some folks who had a very strong meaning system, whether it be religious or spiritual, and now it's like, what the hell? There's no God. Right. Uh, not that that's uh, you don't need to believe in God to be a healthy individual or, or, or having a good life. But if you did believe in God before you served or you did believe in God before you became a first responder and now you're being exposed to all this horror and you don't believe in it, that can potentially lead to some very disturbing uh, situations, including suicide. Yeah. So those are the kinds of moral injuries that I run into. So I'll give you what I've observed and you tell, and you please correct me or, or add. So the breakdown of moral injury, the bad stuff I did personally, and I feel shitty about the stuff I wish I could have done, but I didn't. Yeah. I either didn't or couldn't. So yeah. I had to witness things that I could not intervene in. Yes. And were horrible. And I wish to God I could have done something, but I couldn't. That happens a lot on the UN tours. And what was happening what happened to me that was just morally wrong. Those are the, the uh, three. Yeah, things. that's excellent. You said it beautifully, much better than I could have. <laughs> yeah, then <laughs> there's also, I like to call it, when I work with first responders, organizational trauma. So you're not being supported by your unit. You're not being supported by your leaders. Um, and that I see a lot of, a lot of. And then there's- Our the moral... tour of, of Croatia in 1994, Op Harmony, Roto 4. Uh, what you just described, there's people all these years later, I mean, 1994 was a, was a while ago and uh, people are still ferociously angry today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. not because of the bombs and the bullets. We actually didn't mind that. Most of us, I, I kind of like that part, but how we were treated by our own people mm -hmm. was freaking horrendous. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the anger that I hear when people come up with these stories to this day mm -hmm. is still there. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Afghanistan with uh, what's going on there, and 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 how that's really creating a lot of anger for folks as well. You know, with we go on with the withdrawal in Afghanistan. Did you have an uptick in business? Yes, yes. Um, not so much with. Um, well, I had an uptick, and I also had. I was worried about the folks I was already working with. Uh, very worried about them. Yeah, and as you've probably heard, there were more suicides as a result of that yeah i expected that there would be with uh, the afghanistan withdrawal i immediately had a couple of emergency broadcasts and um and i was really hoping i was going to be wrong but you yeah. but uh, you saw a wave of um uh, of suicides as a result of that withdrawal what do you think is the sense of is it a sense of hopelessness what was going on with those vets um that uh they, they thought this is just too much and I'm, I'm going to punch out. I mean, I, 
I think that they believed that they were there was a mission and of recovery and of um, of restoration, and it seemed like when the plug was pulled, uh, all of that was for nothing. At least that might be the way they interpreted it. Whether it was correct or not, the fact is that was the interpretation. Um, and interestingly, I've I've seen a pattern of that with a lot of. Uh, missions. Uh, Rwanda is another example. Uh, yeah, so it's it's interesting. Any of those and, African tours are just uh, brutal. Have you uh, treated anybody with a Haitian tour? I I wish I would have, but nope, because they don't want to. So awesome. it's not that I haven't met them. They just they're not willing, and I understand that, and I respect it. And um, yeah, it's. It's pretty awful, yeah. Um, Steve Stanford just uh, popped in in the chant here. Let's see what he's got to say. Okay. All right, Steve, let's read this for you. How about the negative stuff a person does that results from PTSD, as an example, would be a, um, like a soldier coming home and numbs himself by drinking and wakes up years later with a lot of regrets because they numb themselves. Uh, I'm going to say to Steve, I'm going to start off with that. The injury isn't your fault, brother. Numbing yourself from the injury is a normal, reasonable response. It's the coping mechanism that was available to you, so you went towards it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's your responsibility to go, wait a second, I don't think this is a healthy coping mechanism. I've got to get treatment for this. I've got to find other coping mechanisms. But the injury is not your fault. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that you can do is keep promises to yourself, Steve, to find better ways to cope. And, and, and Steve, in, in solidarity, I've been sober for about a year and a half. And a big reason that I've done that is in solidarity with uh, uh, everybody that is using alcohol to cope. That's why I won't have a drop because uh, it's standing in solidarity with you. Now, uh, Crystal, what would you say to Steve? Exactly the same thing that you so beautifully said. It is an injury and, and it's not his fault. Um, and uh, drinking or any dis we call it dissociative behavior is a way to avoid the pain and it's a way to stop the pain it's a way to take a vacation from the pain so why wouldn't you drink if you were experiencing PTSD symptoms yeah I mean if I'm having intrusive thoughts and I'm having flashbacks and I'm having moral injury and I, I don't feel like I fit into civilian life because people want to talk about the weather uh, I'm gonna go home and drink <laughs> so and don't forget, Steve, it, it was our fucking culture, right? Mm, like from, um, from September to, uh, to to New Year's, there's how many different occasions for drinking? Mm -hmm. Regimental birthdays, this, that, and the other. And it's like, oh, let's go get smashed again. It was mm -hmm. part of the culture. And, and we were told that this is not just acceptable, but is rewarded behavior. This is what makes a good soldier, is to be able to... Uh, drink half a bottle of whiskey in an hour and it, it was part of the culture and it's wrong for that to be part of the culture but it was we had rum rations when you're out in the field on winter x you know like what does that tell you that mm -hmm. this is just part of the culture let's drink to this person let's drink to that person here's the regimental drink here's the moose milk the dram buey and it and it's part of who um of how we're told is not just acceptable, but promoted. So using it as a coping mechanism, of course you did. Of course you fucking did. Mm -hmm. Be kind to yourself, Steve, um, and everybody else listening. Be kind to yourself. You know, it, now, again, the, the difference between excuses, <laughs> it's not an excuse. It's a reason. These are, these, are, these are mitigating factors, but it's still our responsibility to go, wait a second, that's not okay. And I've got to do something different. Yeah, and it's hard to get the benefit of treatment when you're still drinking. So that's mm -hmm. the that's the piece that 
is super important. And I mean, I don't think I need to tell anybody this, <laughs> but I'll say it anyways. Drinking just makes things a whole lot worse. <laughs> it does. <laughs> It's a short-term coping mechanism with long, yeah. uh, but long-term it is extra rocks in the rucksack. It, exactly. It, it, you're dragging a boat anchor. It is yeah. so much harder. To yeah. Drag. And the mood tanks, the mood tanks, it gets worse and worse. And yeah. you are starting to think crazy thoughts. Like, why don't I just kill myself? Because your mood is in the toilet. Yeah. 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 Uh, raising your vibration, raising your energy level is, is what you need to be doing. And, um, it, the drinking feels like it works in the moment. I fucking get it. And I it does. Get, it does. You know, it's great short term in mm -hmm. the moment, you know, until it's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Until it's not. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. What's the efficacy, Crystal, of EMDR compared to others? Uh, let's put it against ART head to head. Oh, <laughs> ART AR is pretty similar, right? You're, you're still moving your eyes back and forth. Follow my finger. Follow my yeah, finger. Yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't have as much research. And um, I'm going to go out on a limb and take a risk here. But uh, when I heard about ART at OSI, by the way, I'm not there anymore. I'm in private practice. But when I was there, uh, I was really upset because there's just not enough research behind ART. And I'm the kind of therapist that I want the best for my clients. So if there's not good efficacy, good research, I am not using it. Like why, why, on, why would I want to use anything that I know doesn't really have a lot of research behind it? So that has no research. Uh, EMDR, however, has 25 years of research behind it now. Um, and thanks to Dr. Ad DeJong and Dr. Susie Matheson, who are busy working in the clinic in the Netherlands and researching as we speak, like they're not just dealing with anecdotal research with clients coming to their office. They're actually doing solid research that's being published in journal articles. What they've been able to show is that EMDR is a match with uh, prolonged exposure, which is the gold standard. Prolonged exposure, however, has a high dropout rate because it means that you have to talk about all the details of your trauma over and over and over again until it's desensitized. And although we know this works really well, nobody Generally, people don't want to do that. Or it's fucking brutal. It's horrible. Yeah. It's so yeah. Brutal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, one of my traumas, <laughs> uh, there's so many, but one of them was when I hit a tripwire. I'm the only guy I know that hit a tripwire and didn't go boom. Right. Mm. And, but I was expecting to go boom. So that microsecond of time was relived for about 20 hours. Oh, God. So oh, I so you did the prolonged exposure. Well, it was ART. Oh, ART. Okay. So we'd go through it again and again and again. So I was, I had that, that tripwire across my shin for about 20 hours because of therapy. And, um, it, that did harm. Not good. You know, I, I think, I don't think it was done right. <laughs> I was like, I don't think, I don't think so. I, that sounds a little bizarre in EMDR. It it's, it's 60 minutes. Yeah. And, uh, usually it's 50. And, you know, we started as subjective units of disturbance of 10 plus plus in some cases. And un unless the person is struggling with dissociation, because that happens, sometimes people just check out. And by the way, dissociation is a hardwired response. It is not a personal fault. That's quoted directly from Dr. Stephen Porges, who's one of my heroes. Uh, and so people will check out sometimes. And if they check out, we're not going to get the suds down very quickly. We're not going to get the subjective units of disturbance down. But if they're not checking out, and I have all kinds of tools and tricks that I use to keep people present in the room, we almost always get the suds to like a five or six halfway through that 60 minutes. So at 30 minutes, 40 minutes, unless there's something extraordinary happening, the subjective units of disturbance goes down. And we know this from science and the research. We've seen it over and over again. It might take us five sessions to do one operational stress injury because there could be multiple channels meaning there were multiple things that happened over an extended period of time with that particular event but we can absolutely get it desensitized um, and it doesn't take 20 hours it in my experience it might take like two three sessions for one injury and if i do it intensive that means it would take three hours to do one injury but i'm not i i don't believe in that anymore um there are people out there that 
you know, I actually did a talk on it. So I'm going against my talk now. I spoke at EMDR Canada about intensive EMDR for uh, treating vets and first responders, and it worked beautifully, but there was an excluded group. And that excluded group were the people who dissociated, the people that drank, the people that had psychosocial stressors. And I wanna help everybody. I don't wanna just be working with an excluded group, right? So now I just offer EMDR in the 60 minutes and uh, I do it when I know the person is ready. So we've got the psychosocial stressors stabilized. Maybe the person has gone to treatment or they're using the SMART program or they're going to whatever works for you. I don't care. AA, great, SMART, great, a peer group, great. Whatever works for you. As long as I know that person isn't drinking anymore in a way that is going to be exacerbated but when we go into the treatment, um, then we're going to get busy and we're, we're going to do our best to start desensitizing and eliminating those triggers and all of the intrusive thoughts. I'm um, going to circle back a bit. Yeah. Um, all the de all these different types of peer groups that are out there from the Royal Canadian Legion, which I still have to do an episode on. Okay, here's what you're doing wrong. <laughs> here's what you're doing right. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and here's what you need to do to fix it. <laughs> Um, cause I, I love the Legion and, but I'm also very sad because they just are not moving and shaking and making the changes that they need to shake to, to, to do. Um, but it's supposed to be a place of peer support and they've actually become the opposite. Mm, okay. Um, so, uh, in peer support, it can be so fucking dangerous because if you go there, this is the, um, uh, sanctuary trauma that I'm talking about. You go to in a place that's supposed to be a peer support place and you get treated in such a way that you never ever want to come back. And then you have the disconnection. So uh, any of these peer support environments, whether it be uh, the Legion or a formal peer support group or any veterans getaway or veterans retreat, uh, any of these places, um, they are all a very dangerous place to do it wrong because if they don't come back they're probably not going anywhere else either good point yeah so what would you say are some of the do's and don'ts to avoid creating sanctuary trauma oh um hmm. that's a loaded question <laughs> um, i mean so the do's and don'ts of peer support maybe is that what you mean sure the the the, the, do, the, the, the do's and don'ts of peer support but uh, it, specifically, but to avoid sanctuary trauma in, in general, you know, um, whether it be with a therapist or, um, but sure, let's stick within peer support groups, some of the do's and don'ts. Well, you know, I, I, I'm thinking from a therapist hat. So with the peer support, um, I, I probably wouldn't be able to speak to that so much, but I know from wearing a therapist hat that um, safety looks like um, exactly how you just described beautifully uh, a few few minutes ago. Um, first of all, normalizing feelings, um, giving everyone a chance to talk but also when i run my groups especially trauma groups i'm thinking about boundaries and i'm thinking about housekeeping so there's the housekeeping do's and don'ts like don't come to the group junk please you know um because yeah, that's, chances a, are, that, that's a hard no yeah because chances are good you're going to say something that's not so great and you're not it's not going to be a safe place um those are kind of the hard and fast housekeeping, the non-negotiables. But then um, when I'm working with trauma groups, I also create nego uh, negotiables, but there's still norms or boundaries that the group has, the group members come up with on their own. So it becomes their space, their sanctuary, as opposed to my therapist talking down to everybody. <laughs> I'm not into that. I'm into equanimity. Let's all have some re reciprocity here, um, which is probably the definition of peer support, right? We're all kind of on the same page. Um, and so what that looks like in terms of safety is boundaries. So like, is it okay that we swear here? I know that sounds ridiculous, but maybe it's not for some people. You know, I remember running groups, I've run a lot of groups in my career and some people you say fuck and they're out the door. You know, I mean, I don't think that's gonna be the case with Fest, but but in some groups that I've run that, that's, uh-oh. 
I keep getting cut off. Son of a gun. All right, let's start again. Hi, I'm back, back again. Yeah, that's twice. That's all right. It's probably my stupid app. Maybe I'm supposed to stop talking. Just kidding. Well, that's uh, right. Maybe maybe because we're because uh, I said fuck. Maybe that maybe that's what it was. <laughs> no, you can, <laughs> oh my god, that's funny. If it's the right word for the job. Yeah, exactly. Then then let her rip. Uh, um. You know, and so I, 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 are you familiar with VTN, the VTN network? The Veteran, the, Veterans Transition Network. Yeah. And, uh, actually, I really want to have them on the show. I've reached out. Oh, good. They haven't reached back to me, the buggers. Oh, VTN. Okay. Get yeah, back to because me. I just hear such wonderful things about them, and I'm friends with one of the psychologists that used to run the the program. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, it's about having a good understanding of what creates safety. And I feel like a, a lot of programs don't get that. Um, mm. and, and, and what that means too is, uh, is the, is the group has to create their own safety. The VTN is really good at this. I mean, they're, they're trained at doing this. this they're going to be experts on talking about this. Um, how do you create that safety amongst members in your group? How do you do that? And you do that by creating norms and you do that by creating boundaries that the group has decided on and then what you do is you create this really awesome sense of safety which then allows people to do that work to open up to talk about things that they need to talk about um and um but having said that uh the other number one rule for safety and trauma groups is not talking about the stories is not bringing up all of the different um we call it no war porn there we go yes so oh, i love it yes yes um and and so the groups that i run are more skills based so i do education and skill so the education is to normalize a lot of the symptoms that people are experiencing so they don't think they're going crazy and then i talk about the research and what the research has told us i talk about all the different treatment modalities so people can make up their own mind and then we teach skills on how to regulate the nervous system. You know, here's what you do when you have a panic attack. Here's what you can do when um, you're starting to get intrusive thoughts. You know, here's some apps that are really helpful, like my mind app. And here's some uh, EMDR apps for pain, EMDR apps for sleep. Um, so yeah, I'm a big believer in teaching people skills. So EMDR is fantastic, but it's not gonna give you skills. It's not gonna teach you skills. So I like to do both. So I don't know if I really answered your question, but but that's been my experience as a as a group facilitator. No, I think so. And um, I've got three books in me on the topic that <laughs> that, that, that I'm going to get out at some time. And um, it'll probably be about connection and how to do it the right way. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to uh, read what Vince uh, Fowler, a veteran friend of mine, uh, th threw out here. Military peer groups, I avoid them. I don't find them to be healthy places for me. Personally, I find far too many people unwilling to be active participants in their own journey of recovery. I chose a peer support um, instead within his own industry. And I hear that a lot, Vince. Um, there's so many people that go into a peer support group and figure, okay, I'll try this. And they pop right back out because either it's it's full of people that are steeped in the victim mentality, or at least that's their perception of it. And I'm a victim, I'm a victim, and I'm just going to sit here and be validated in my victimhood. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that is a problem. The way, but I used to run um, a BNI chapter as Business Networking International. Okay. Uh, they have a set structure. And this is how you do it, and these are the rules. But even though everybody has the exact same structure, the exact same rules, and it's around the world, you go to 10 different places, you'll have 10 different flavors. It'll mm -hmm. feel like 10 different, they'll be saying the same words in the same order with the same rules, but they'll all feel different. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion is try a different military peer group. You know, the, the way I used to run it, uh, it was John Senior's group, and then, um, he needed a break, so he handed it over to me, went and I took the course, which I thought was mostly useless. And um, in the group, 
the focus was always on moving forward. What are the practical strategies, the tools, what works for me, what works for you? What are the success stories? How do we move forward? How do we not be the asshole? You know, how do we not wreck the camping trip? How do I not wreck uh, dinner? How? What are the tools? What works for Mm -hmm. me? And how do we move forward? Mm -hmm. And that was always, always, always the focus of the groups. And, and that's actually how this show was born out of that group Mm -hmm. um, to try to scale it, to provide those exact same strategies to everybody that wants to tune in. And now we've got 55 countries tuning in. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. But um, I'm with Vince on that. Do you have uh, on the victim mentality? I'm moving forward. What are your thoughts, Crystal? Oh, wow. I mean, that's so well said. Uh, 100%. There is no gain from sitting around and um, reinforcing that victim uh, mentality or victim story. Uh, there's nothing to gain from that. Um, I call it the rabbit hole. You're going down the rabbit hole and it's going to be really hard to climb back up. So you don't want to go too deep down that rabbit hole because you're not going to get out. Um, and so 100%. And uh, that's why when I run groups, uh, I don't let people go into their trauma narrative uh, because it's inevitable that that is going to, and it's like there's a, we call it a contagion factor. So one person goes down the rabbit hole, guess what? everybody's going down the rabbit hole trauma olympics start exactly and uh uh, in a more crude way i call it measuring your trauma dicks yeah you know my (laughs) trauma dick's bigger than your trauma dick and um yeah yeah it's not helpful yeah no where's the line crystal like i i I, and i've said this a few times although i'm careful about saying it is like look yes i'm here to listen i'm here to hold space i will do that but where is the fucking line Where it's like, okay, I've already been holding the space for like a long time. Now we have to move forward. And and I think that that awkwardness between those two of um, the difference between holding space and moving towards um, forward with solutions, people jump into the solutions too quick. And then then the person that needed the space held for them doesn't feel heard uh, because you're in solution mode. It's a tough balance. But uh, how, how would you juggle those flaming chainsaws? Oh, wow. Uh, that is, uh, man, if I, I wish I could package the answer to that and sell it to grad school and PhDs. Uh, that's, that is a million dollar question, uh, a billion dollar question. It, it's a dance. I'm working on it. <laughs> it. Yeah, me too. I'm working on it. I don't think anybody can be really good at it. Um, and every time you have a, a group of different people, you're going to have different energy. You're going to have different uh, dynamics as well. Um, but I do think it's very much like a dance. You know, you go in for a couple steps, you figure out what the dynamics are, you move back a couple steps. Okay, no, we're going to go back a little bit. You move in, you go back. It's fluid, right? Um, but again, I think it goes back to those norms. You know, if everyone in the room agrees on the norms, now it's a bit different if it's an open peer group, right? If it's open and anybody can come in and out, that might be a little challenging, but you can still have basic norms that are going to create sanctuary that people agree to. And if they don't agree to that, they sh- then it's not the right group for them. Or maybe they don't go to that group, or maybe they go to a different type of group. I and sometimes, them- sometimes just perception too. You can have the best group in the world that's solutions based and, and forward moving and, and non judgmental, but if somebody isn't ready, and they walk in, you're going to hear what they're going to hear. Exactly. You know, exactly. You can't, you can't fix it. Yeah. You're going to hear their preconceived notions and they're going to get confirmation bias and, <laughs> exactly. and they're going to pop out no matter what's happening in that room. Exactly. And I just say they're not ready. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that yeah. they won't come back and it doesn't mean that a different group might not work for them. I mean, some people really love the skills group because it's just about skills. It's not about going into narrative. It's not about, Uh, talking about feelings so much because maybe they're not ready for that it's just about give me a skill so i can learn how to sleep give me a skill so i can learn how to uh, not go from zero to 110 seconds give me a skill so i don't check out and end up numb and doing some kind of extreme sport to feel alive 
or whatever I do to feel alive because I'm so bloody numb, right? So yeah, so those are great groups for people who aren't ready, right? Because that's the beginning of being in group with other people. There's so much value in just being around people too, right? And getting out of the house. So much value in not isolating. And 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 even if it's only like, frankly, even if it's just going to the grocery store, even though that's a big trigger festival for a lot of people, at least you're getting out of the house, you know? So I do a lot of work with folks around exposure and just getting out of the house. Have you found in the veteran community, um, and I'm just thinking about myself here when I ask this question, but have you found with, with, with your clients people that are really having trouble with um, the lockdown measures and even wearing a mask? And uh, personally, wearing a mask gives me just tremendous fucking anxiety. Mm. Like it, it's I have to wait in the parking lot for 20 minutes to get to steal myself before I can walk into that store. And um, so a lot of times I'm just not, I, I know the store that won't give me a hard time. So I go to that store with no mask. And, um, but if I'm going into a place where I know I have to wear one and I have to go in there, I'll do everything I can to avoid it. But if I have to 20 minutes in the uh, breathing exercises and everything else before I can put it on and go in. And I don't even know why that is. It just is. Have you been, uh, uh, having in your in your client base have you been seeing in the veteran community is that a common thing or yeah yeah i mean i see it across all communities with the mask there seems to be a trigger with panic and the mask and i think it's because the person isn't can't feel there's a psychological component to it around not being able to breathe uh, fully or having full control whenever you're in a, a person is in a situation where they feel like they don't have full control they potentially are in a trigger. Uh, uh, well, they're in a trigger, a PTSD trigger. So, I yeah, see somebody I, that's been choked or suffocated or drowned. exactly. Yes, hundred percent. And actually, when I do EMDR around the panic, that's what we find is that there is some kind of uh, trauma around choking or suffocating in the past that we need to look at desensitizing. Um, and as far as the lockdowns go, that's been a nightmare for my vets. Um, and that's been really difficult. So when those restrictions are lifted, I'm, I kind of sigh a relief because I know that, okay, at least they can get swimming now or they can, you know, it's not as bad as it was, but yeah, that was a nightmare and that was really difficult for folks. Yeah. And it just reinforced the isolation, right. And reinforced the, everything that we know doesn't work for treatment. So that was really tough. Yeah. Last remembrance day, all the regular ceremonies were shut down. They weren't being held. And uh, it looks like that's going to happen again this Remembrance Day. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a cenotaph in Okotoks, that's our town, where we just show up anyway. And there's a, we just do it anyway. And uh, the cop showed up last year, didn't say peep, they just um, joined us in the ceremony. Nice. But still, you know, I still look it over my shoulder like, are you going to arrest us or are you going to join us? Which yeah. Is, what's it yeah. going to do? And um, it's going to be the same thing this year. Do you yeah. um, uh, do anything for like the two weeks coming up to uh, Remembrance Day? Is, is, do you set anything aside or, or special tools for your client list? Because it's always a, it's a rough two weeks, and especially the last week um, moving up to it. It's, it's just rough. And I think this year is going to be extra rough. Yeah, I mean, I'll just have the same discussion that I have at Christmas because I found Christmas is also a very difficult time and so I'll start to prepare we'll start to talk about you know what are the skills what are the safety plans we're gonna uh, think about what are we going to be thinking about when it comes to being around alcohol because there's lots of celebrations and uh, not celebrations but yeah I guess so some dinners or alcohol tends to be around more November 11th um, and so I'm, I'm doing the same kind of safety plans uh, that I would do at Christmas, basically. Yeah. Okay. Where else are we going here? I was distracted by the background noise that I can hear. Oh yeah. There's a weed whacker outside my house. <laughs> I, was wondering, I, I, was I don't wondering know if it's going to get worse. Probably. That's all right. That's what I had last year. <laughs> or, uh, uh, last show. How important is peer support in general? I mean, I think peer support is a critical. 
but it's the way that peer support is rolled out that's important. So I think it's absolutely critical for some kind of peer support to be available to uh, vets and first responders. Um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in a group format. It can be, um, I don't know, a, a, some, you know, the 12 step have got this mastered, like AA, for example, they have a central office, somebody needs a person to take them to a meeting, they call central office, central office finds somebody that lives close to their uh, neck of the woods. And that person goes, knocks on the door and says, hey, let's go to a meeting, right? Um, that to me is excellent peer support. It works great. That's the kind of peer support that I don't know if that exists because again, I'm not an expert in the community. I'm just a therapist, but it, that, that to me, I think is critical uh, for both communities. Uh, do they need to be in a group and talking about their war stories? Probably not. I don't feel that that's necessarily effective. Yeah. Well, Crystal, thank you so much for being on the show here today. Um, You're welcome. We're at about an hour 10, and I feel that uh, we have a lot more to talk about. We should probably do this again. Yeah, it's just been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's been fantastic, and I'm glad to learn more about EMDR. It's something I hear a lot about. I've never tried it myself. but um, and, and we covered a lot of really good ground that I think covers a lot of FAQs um, for, for people that are kind of on the outside looking in, uh, <laughs> wondering, geez, should I do that therapy thing? It's kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Please stay on the line. Okay. You're listening to Operation Tango Romeo, the Trauma Recovery Podcast. And we're good. All right. All right. Well, I thought that we